Hello together, moin aus Mainz, this is a new episode of the Wingfall Experience Podcast and this is a very, very special one to me. I could say that I've been waiting for this interview all my life. It would be a kind of an over exaggeration. I don't know if this is the right English term, but anyhow, I've been visualizing this interview since I started the podcast. When I started this podcast, my goal was to interview Robbie Nash and... Um, I, don't worry, I have more goals planned, but this is the first big milestone after one year, actually, since I started this podcast, since you started listening to this podcast and we created this community within the Wingfall community. Um, and now we have Robbie Nash in the show and I was super stoked. He's a very kind and friendly person. He's a real legend in water sports. And we covered a ton in this interview. We talked about his movie. We talked about wing falling, obviously. We talked about Kailani. We talked about backflips. We talked about everything that we had time for. And um, I hope you really enjoyed this one. Here he is, Mr. Robbie Nash. Welcome everybody to another Wingfall Experience podcast and this is obviously and that's something that you heard probably a couple of times the most requested one with Mr. Robbie Nash. Robbie, how are you? I'm good. Good morning. Nice to be here. Good morning. We're both having a cup of coffee but yours is in the morning, mine is late in the evening so mine is without caffeine. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> Because I'm at the other end of the world. And first question is always the podcast, like, when was your last Wingfall session? Uh, let's see. Was it yesterday or did we not get out yesterday? We didn't actually get out yesterday. Two days ago, day before yesterday. So And strong winds? <laughs> no, actually, uh, for a change, pretty light winds. Actually kind of underpowered on a 5.3, which is... Mm -hmm unusual but we had a big kind of storm uh that came through maui over the last couple of days and it made kind of light wind so it was a nice change really mellow not many people out mm -hmm. and uh just kind of cruising on my own and actually went out and met uh titwan he's here mm -hmm. at the moment after the gorge and uh, i hadn't seen him in geez a long time and uh Rode with him at the outer reef of Kana for a little while. Talked to him about his his uh, last times, and uh, so yeah, two days ago. And I'll be going today. I've, I've been waiting for a a prototype wing that's been stuck in customs, and we've been waiting and waiting and waiting to test it, and it arrives this morning. So we'll be on the water again today. Nice. Did uh, did one casually throw some backflips in? I, I think that's something that I see him doing all the time. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, if you can do backflips, you do it all the time in the beginning. It's <laughs> like like windsurfing. When you first learn forward loops, all you want to do is forward loops. When you first learn push loops, all you want to do is push loops. So yeah, he he did a couple nice little ones uh, for me. I've still never tried. I'm not sure I will, but uh, it's pretty cool. He's riding really well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, for for me, that's the most fascinating thing about wing falling is that you can connect the maneuvers so easily and so fast. Even um, I'm just a regular amateur guy, but but even I can do it. And and that's something that I see with the pros and that they are casually doing all the stuff within 30 meters range. Uh, crazy. Yeah. And it's Titwan definitely, is uh, yeah. definitely very accessible. No question. Mm -hmm. So a, a question that I had in mind, and you're the first person I'm asking it, is how do you call it? Do you call it wing falling or wing surfing or something I else? I call it wing surfing. Um, wing surfing. You know, of course, 99% of the time you're on a foil, but uh, I still call it wing surfing. Yeah. Shit. So now I have to rename the podcast. It's gonna be cool. Okay. You, you can call it whatever you want. It's all good. <laughs> I, I just, to me, it's all surfing. You mm -hmm. know, I call kite surfing kite surfing as well. Most people call it kite boarding. It's uh, it, it's all different styles of of surfing to me. 
Um, when we say to our friends, hey, do you want to go winging? So if, mm -hmm. if it's just in a casual sentence, we say winging. Um, mm -hmm. So let's stick with kite sur uh, wing <laughs> kite surfing let's stick with wing surfing then for now and for this podcast so the next question um would be when was your first wing surfing session do you remember that one uh not really my first one i'm getting old that was a long time ago uh <laughs> one two three almost four years four years ago um doing a downwinder you know the, the first time we went was actually using a a, was it a two five or a three meter boxer kite one of mm -hmm. our kites with no strings no bar just just holding the the wing mm -hmm. doing a downwinder sup mm -hmm. you know sup foiling which I've never been a big downwind guy, whether it's on a SUP or on a foil or anything. It's, it's just too slow. Uh, <laughs> and going with even a little bit of a wing is much faster than paddling. Well, mm -hmm. not really. I mean, if, if you see the fast guys paddling, going straight downwind, they're actually every bit as fast as the wing foil guys. But, uh, It's sure more fun when you're up and holding on to the wind. And to me, you know, I've been catching the wind my entire life. And so it was much more natural to head in that direction than to, you know, be SUP foiling all the time. In a place as windy as Maui, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. So it was almost four years ago, I guess, we made our first, you know, committed prototype of a wing that was made to be held on to instead of holding on to the the kite surfing kite. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you come up with the idea to go for it? What was the initial thought? Well, it, it wasn't my idea. It wasn't anything new. The Ken Winner had been playing around with them. We, we mm -hmm. had been watching him for months, but it wasn't looking very interesting. He, he was already doing downwinders on, on wings. Uh, Lagosh at Slingshot had already been playing with some wings. I think he saw Ken doing it. Other people had been playing with it, but they didn't make it look very interesting yet. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, it's it's different when you try something yourself and think, oh, we could do it like this. And so, yeah, we, we took the idea and uh, or, or, or took that ball and kind of ran with it but we certainly didn't uh, invent it. You know, mm -hmm. even in fact, I have a wind weapon still in my garage that I was uh, yeah. doing a YouTube video with. I, I unzipped it for the first time in well over 30 years and wow. put it together. And uh, I had a wind skate when I was a teenager, which is basically the same thing with an aluminum frame. Um, so these concepts and ideas come around and they all have a time just like hydrofoils hydrofoil windsurfing has been around for decades it just mm -hmm. never took off foil surfing was around 20 years ago uh, but it never took off so everything has a time and mm -hmm. even though guys had played with the wings and the foils the time just wasn't right until mm -hmm. you know we started playing with it and we started playing with it i think right at the time when it was ready to go uh and uh obviously the interest has been huge i knew it was going to be big you know we we got it we developed it we realized how easy it was to to learn you know i got my girlfriend who's not a foiler she she got going in in three top tries back and forth she was already on the foil and mm -hmm. So we said, yeah, this, this definitely has a future. Let's let's get into it. Let's push it. We did, a, you know, our initial launch of the 4.6 Wing Surfer. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. I mean, mm -hmm. it's taken off faster than any sport I've ever seen. Yeah. It's a, definitely a, a result of the Internet and social media and how fast things get around the world. You know, in the old days, it would have taken – a couple of years probably to get to the point we're at right now in wing foiling uh, because what happens today is already 
in half an hour on the other side of the world and information grows and trends move very, very, very quickly. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been an interesting journey in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one great example in the recent wing falling history, I guess, was a backflip. Um, so Jeffrey Spencer, I guess, released a video about the backflip and Baltz Müller um, did it the other day. Yeah. He saw the video and he had been trying it for six months and, and he saw the video and then he realized that he doesn't have to use the wing to backflip that the, and, and the next day he did it. And it's at the other side of the world in Switzerland on a lake. So Maui to Switzerland, 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I watched, Crazy. I was part of a, a podcast with Balls after he saw that and he said, yeah, he couldn't even sleep at night. All he was thinking about was backflips, 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 backflips. And yeah, that's, that's how the internet is. So it has some positive things and it has some negative things. I'm not yeah. sure if the negatives are stronger or the positives are stronger, but, uh, It's definitely changed the way we, we learn and it's changed the dynamic of, of business and everything because information is so quick. Mm -hmm. the, the question that I had in mind when you decided to play with the wing um, and you said it yourself, the time was not right. So everything has its time, like surf falling and wind falling, like What made you believe? What were your beliefs? What were your predictions? Now is the time for wing falling. And did they turn out true or false? Well, for me, it's, it's always personal. What do I want to do? You know, I, I've never looked at this like, oh, I'd like to do this because I think we could sell some. Or uh, I think this would be cool. I don't really like it but let's do it anyway because other people think it's cool. Everything we do at, at Nash, we do because I want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not making uh, iPhone cases and we're not making, uh, you know, a lot of things that we could use the sourcing and technology and manufacturing for other products based on what we do. We don't do any of that. So we do what's fun, what we enjoy, and it's all stemmed from, Ex exploration, experimentation, and playing here on Maui. That's what, you know, led me through windsurfing. That's what led us into kite surfing. That's what led us into stand-up paddling. That's what led us into surf foiling. That's what's led us into to winging, is that desire to play and surf and use the wind and the waves in, in different ways. And when I saw how much fun I was having winging, uh, that was it. I'm like, well, fuck, I'm having fun. I'm going to make them for myself anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm positive that other people are going to love it too because of the reactions of the people here. Mm -hmm. And whether the time was right commercially or not, we were going to do it because it was fun and I wanted the, to have wings for myself. I wanted to have foils for myself. Mickey and my guys, we want equipment for us to play with. And if we're going to make it for ourselves, we might as well offer it for other people <laughs> as well. Um, and so that's kind of been the story of the brand up to now is, is mm -hmm. our quest for selfish fun, finding its way into the business model, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but again, I knew it was going to take off. Mm -hmm but I had no idea it was going to get this popular this quickly. Uh, and we were ready. Like I was slated for production. We knew we were ahead of all the other brands that were frantically trying to get into it because they, that first post that I did on Instagram and Facebook, like opened the floodgates. Mm -hmm. When I said, this is the Nash wing server and it's so much fun. It's like every brand went, we're in. And fortunately, it takes a little while for brands to at least, you know, make stuff and get it out. But it's still ridiculous how quickly it's come. Like there's more than 60 brands now, brands yeah. making yeah. wings. You know, I know every manufacturer in the world and they're all full. There's no materials available. Everybody's running around. Though. If you're in the windsurfing business or you're in the kite surfing business or you're in the foiling business or you're in the whatever business, you're making wings now or trying to make wings. So the market is already flooded. 
with too much shit, but Mm -hmm. it is what it is. You know, it's exciting because there's a brand new sport that, uh, that didn't exist five years ago. That's now taking the world by storm. And it's exciting because it's a great way to get people on the water. It's Mm -hmm. honestly, in my opinion, if you take windsurfing or kite surfing or any foil boat, you know, foil sailing, Mm -hmm. winging is the least expensive, the easiest to learn, the most accessible, and in shitty conditions, you know, gusty wind, light wind, a small area, it's the best way to get out and have fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always say if if you're just going to go mow the lawn, you're going to go out to a lake and you've got shitty gusty wind and you just want to go ride back and forth. This is the best way to do that. It's, it's easy. Anyone can do it. It's technical, but it's fun. You're flying. You're, um, it's amazing. I mean, kiting is amazing, but kiting has limitations because of the strings, because of the lines, because of getting in and out of the water in places where you don't have a lot of space. Uh, if the wind is offshore and you have trees and it's gusty, I mean, you know how it is going out on a gusty lake with the wind going like this. Kiting sometimes not the easiest alternative. Uh, windsurfing, kind of the same. If you want to take a huge board and go out and just sail around on the lake, that's still fun today, even mm-hmm. in really light wind. But nobody does it. You can't even find a big board anymore, hardly, right? There's the Windsurfer LT. And if you have an old Mistral under your garage from 30 years ago, you can take it. But it's not trendy. Nobody really does it. Everybody wants to ride a small board with a high-performance sail. And unfortunately, to have fun on that gear in shitty conditions and gusty winds, you have to be really good. You have mm-hmm. thousands of euros worth of equipment just to get out there. I mean, just the mast is a thousand euros and your fin is, you know, 800 euros. And, you know, to really go in those winds, it's not easy. So yeah. SUP, sure, you can go paddling around on the lake. Obviously, that's fun. Thousands of people are doing it. But as soon as there's like 10 knots of wind, paddling on an SUP is kind of shit, right? Mm-hmm. Um So the wing is an amazing alternative for people all over the place of different abilities, different skills, and in very normal conditions to go have a lot of fun. You know, I have friends, uh, for example, that work for Red Bull in in Austria, and they go out on Lake Fuschel. Fuschel is this, this tiny little lake. There's not really enough wind very often to do any real wind sports, but they're having a blast winging. And they're winging all the time. So uh, it's definitely the right sport at the right time with a lot of opportunity that a lot of people are getting on the water, have fun with. And uh, I think it's super cool. Yeah. It changed my life. It changed my life. I'm a windsurfer since the 90s. And there's not, there may be 20 days around here in the middle of Germany where you can actually windsurf properly if you don't want to get bigger than 6'5 or something like that. And, and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it changed yeah. my life because I have now so many days on the water that I even don't need to have a holiday. And, and I used to organize all my life around camper trips to go to the best spots, to go strapless kiting and windsurfing. Yeah. And, and now and all now my you friends can go are have fun at home. Yeah. All my friends are in cold Hawaii right now. And of course, I have a little bit of FOMO when I see the forecast and the swell. But I can I can have my river wave and 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 I, I I was on the river wave yesterday and it was fun it's it's maybe knee high <laughs> but, yeah but you can you can ride it you can fall it and it's the same stoke yeah so yeah it's as, it's very cool and and that's actually also the reason for this podcast I started it because I neglected wing falling for the first one and a half years that I've seen it around. And since I started it, I love it. And I thought, okay, we have to get the message out there. <laughs> People need to see what they're missing. It's too much fun. Yeah. yeah it, it's also good because you can fit quite a few into a spot without really feeling crowded. Mm-hmm. You know, 
it's uh, yeah, it's good in that way. It doesn't take a lot of space. Yeah. Um, I, I heard you say um, about the early days of windsurfing that when you had your windsurfer with a, a with a wooden boom and the triangle sail, that you said it was the best thing I could imagine. It was so much fun. I was not thinking about how I could improve it. I just wanted to ride it. And and I thought like, this is exactly how I felt about the version one of wing foiling. And everybody in my spots is telling me like, I'm going to wait till it's further developed. And I'm, I, I kind of get the point, but I'm like, you're missing all the fun, dude. Yeah. And so what, what would you tell people who are waiting? I, I think the longer they wait, the worse it gets, actually. Um, <laughs> if you looked at my whole first promotional thing, the beauty is in the simplicity. Uh -huh. And there was something awesome about having only one size. You know, like the original Wingster for 4.6. Yeah, you had to pump to get it going in light wind, but you could get it going in light wind. Once you're on the foil, you know, you can hold it with two fingers. You don't need a lot of power to go once you're up on the foil on the wing, right? So sometimes you got to work to get going, but once you're up there, it's like, oh, you could, you could use that one size in 12 knots. You could use it in 30 knots. And unfortunately, there's this incredible race which comes from competition, right? It comes from different brands getting in. It comes from people wanting to get inventive and, you know, push things and it's all good. But the unfortunate side to that is that it, it rapidly develops things in such a way that, I mean, winging is turning into windsurfing already in, in three years. You know, all the mistakes that windsurfers made making the sport too extreme and too expensive and too complicated and on and on and on is happening overnight in winging. Like everyone says, you need more power. You need more power. I need more power. It's like, okay, I, I get it. You need power to get up. If you don't have skill, if you want to just stand there and hold the wing and do nothing and wait for it to lift you up. Yeah. You need some power in your wing. Mm -hmm. But that usually only lasts a couple of weeks until you actually know how to get up on the foil. And then once you're up on the foil, this, this power is kind of your enemy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you don't want power once you're up and going. You don't want, you know, this constant pull. You're going to end up seeing that everyone's from went from having one size of wing. Now you're going to need five sizes of wing because every time the wind goes up or down a little bit, you got to change your wing size because the range gets smaller as the power gets bigger. Everybody's going to be wearing a harness because they're too powerful and there's always pull in their arms. And yeah, it's, it's progress and it's getting more high performance. Yeah. You're going to go faster. You're going to be able to go in lighter wind. You're going to be able to do on and on and on. But to a degree, the simplicity was so awesome. You know, mm -hmm. the, the sooner you get into the sport, the more pure it is, right? Don't wait mm -hmm. for the gear to get even more complicated. Don't wait until there's 50 choices in the store and you're complicated on which one to go buy. And everybody says you need something different. Um, mm -hmm. The early days are always fun. And yeah, maybe you're going to buy equipment that you're going to sell in six months and buy something else. But you can give it to a friend and stoke out a friend who's getting into the sport or, or sell it to a guy who's just starting. Um, right now, there's, there's more demand than equipment anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I agree, there's nothing wrong with the very first generation of, of gear. It's still just like a windsurfer. A 12-foot windsurfer with a triangle sail and a wooden boom is mm -hmm. still so much fun to go out and learn to ride on. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes the hype of progress hides that that pure, simple fun, you know. Oh, I, I want that. I got to have – you know, you have people learning to wing, and they're coming up, and they're going, well, I, th I think I need all carbon this, and I need uh, – everybody says I need like a 6.0, and um, 
I think I need a 95 mask. My friend says, yeah, I should start on a 95. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, you could do all that. But no, you don't really need to start at that level. So yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, it, it's, it's always interesting being at the beginning of something because you see all that evolution, right? And yeah. you see the stuff being outdated and I'm the kind of guy, like you said, that still loves to ride the simplest stuff. I don't want to change my gear every day. I'm not in the race to progress. I don't want to prove to everyone. That, I mean, we can, like we have, I have rigid wings already. I don't want to fucking sell them. Um, I know we can make the stuff faster. I know we can make it much more expensive. And it will go in that direction because of competition. But the mm -hmm. longer we can keep it simple, mm -hmm. the more beautiful it is and the bigger the potential for the future uh, there is. That's why it's a shame that it's advancing so quickly because the longer we keep it kind of simple, stupid, the more people will get into it, the more people will be exposed, the, the less people will be scared away because of the complexity and, um, yeah, you know, like I'm still riding an 85 liter board 99% mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. Is it because I'm a kook, because I can't ride a 30 liter board? No, it's because I like this. I like to be able to go off the beach, stand up, no matter what the wind is, and get out. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to fall in the waves, get on my board, and get going really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Everybody's in such a hurry to ride such a small board because it's cool to ride a little board. You see people on the lake. I see videos of guys in Silva Plana or whatever. They're on like 30, 40 liter boards standing up to here, <laughs> pumping and pumping and pumping and, you know, bouncing their 1500 euro foil off the bottom you know, smashing the wings into the rocks and into the sand. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> if I was 16 years old and I want to do backflips, a smaller board definitely has an advantage. But when you watch a 50-year-old guy who's basically just going back and forth doing nothing, he doesn't even jump, and he thinks he's – he needs a 40 liter board because it's, I don't know, somehow super cool. And he spends half the time floating out in the middle of Kanaha trying to water start and destroying his foil because he can't mm -hmm. get up. And I don't know this. I don't understand. You know, I, yeah. I, uh, it's just a platform, you know, mm -hmm. and you want to make it easy, accessible and, I mean, I have a 30 liter board. I have a 50 liter board. I have about a 62 liter race board. I've got all this stuff, but I spend most of my time on my 85 mm -hmm. because it's easy and yeah. I'm not worried about being cool. So I think the more we can keep people focused on just the pure fun and not the hype, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to walk into a, a shop and the guy in the store says, oh yeah, you need a... You need a 40 liter board and you need five wings and you need a boom because booms. Yeah, it's better with a boom. This is not windsurfing. Don't turn it mm -hmm. into windsurfing, you know, make, leave it simple. But the, the fun part is we have already been there in windsurfing. I remember the times in the 90s when I went to the lake where I learned windsurfing the first time as a 12 year old kid. And there were guys down to their waist in the water with sinker boards and they were trying to get it going on the lake. And, and I thought to myself as a 12 year old kid, why do they make it so complicated? I can have, I'm having fun on my 120 liter board as a 45, 50 kilo guy. And I had a blast and I, yeah. and I wrote this board, no under, no overestimation. I think 15 years, I had it in my quiver just because it was yeah. fun. And, and, yeah. and, and I always felt like my ability did not um, how, over, overtake the, the board, you know, capabilities, you know, so I always felt like I can still improve even on this board. For sure. So. You, you see that every day where 
and, and again, I'm I'm maybe really old school. Like, I like to get to the beach. I rig up. I go ride. I come back. I put my stuff away and I leave. Mm-hmm. And you see these other guys. They go to the beach. They stand around for an hour talking about their gear, and, and then they go ride for twenty minutes, and then they come back and they stand on the beach for an hour talking about their gear, and it's the same kind of deal where there seems to be this, for whatever reason, uh, race to make things more complicated. And you'll see people out saying, well, I need this and I need that and I need this, Mm. but they can barely ride, right? Mm They're, they're not really even enjoying going and learning just just to be out in the wind and feel the water because they're already racing to try to figure out what they need to change in their gear to make them better. Um, the gear is not the problem. And you look at him and you go, <laughs> dude, your gear is... Your gear is already so much better than you are. You don't need new gear. You need yeah. to just go ride and get better but they're like oh yeah yeah, i need a i need a higher aspect wing and i need this and i need more of that and it's like have you seen a video of yourself riding you know your Mm. your gear is not the problem just go have fun don't worry about your freaking gear but that's just sort of the mentality of of some people you know it's always oh I i gotta have the next best thing i gotta have the next thing I'm the opposite. I could ride my old gear forever and be like totally happy because, you know, I know my first wing is and foil and board are still better than me. Mm-hmm. You know, you, there's a point at which, yeah, you need to evolve, mm-hmm. but uh, you shouldn't be in such a hurry to evolve. Like you said, just go ride for the pure stoke of riding and don't get, don't get hung up on, you know, having an entire van full of equipment so you can always be Mm -hmm. on the perfect thing for the conditions you know Mm -hmm. totally agree um i also feel like uh it's for me it's a mindset that i always tell myself like just master what you have right now first and once you master your gear and you get more into the really the, the small things and you can feel like the foil is oh the foil is stalling here a little bit and then after a while when i get a new foil i feel like oh now i get it now this is insane now i can do 360s because i have the speed to do it and and then when i go back to the other foil that was maybe too slow now i can do the 360 on the small on the slow one because i yeah. improved and not the gear so right, exactly that's awesome yeah robbie um you just mentioned a uh, boom and that uh, that is an interesting question because um uh, there is a there's a patent pending already from duotone on the boom i think since the very first echo that they launched like Is this something that you feel like it's it's actually hurting the sport that there is this whole boom versus handle thing and and what's your what's your viewpoint on that uh, no, point of view? I, mean, I, I don't like booms for sure. I love booms for windsurfing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in winging, I love the soft handles. I love the fact that there's nothing hard on it, and uh, I don't want to turn it into windsurfing. Windsurfing mm-hmm. is its own thing. And there's a lot of people I get, I get, you know, texts from people, oh, when are you going to bring out a boom? The boom is so much more comfortable. It's like, well, if, if you're coming from windsurfing, then I could maybe see why the boom seems natural in the beginning. But to me, only for about five minutes does it feel natural. Then the handles feel much more natural. Um, mm-hmm. But everybody has their own you know their own style with with 60 brands now you've got booms you've got soft handles you've got rigid handles you've got semi-rigid handles you've got lots of choices and and that's going to continue to evolve for sure like i said we will have completely rigid wings in the future for racing Mm -hmm. i'm not in any hurry to go there um because i think again the more hard components the more rigging the more parts that are molded etc 
the more complicated we make it, um, the smaller the scope of the sport gets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's all good. You know, if you want to use a boom, there's there's boom options. There's half boom options. There's mm -hmm. so to, to me, I'm, I'm not going to sit and say, oh, this is better than that. I have my own personal um, opinions, which I love the simplicity. I love mm -hmm. having nothing hard on the wing. Uh, I know that I can take my soft handle wing and go ride all day and never get tired, never get sore hands. I know it's different when you put a boom on. You start to wish you had a harness. It's different holding on to something bigger. It, um, you know, we have a lot of prototypes that you know some of my guys love them, and I mm -hmm. hate them. So mm -hmm. I, I realize sometimes I'm in a different path and I have different uh, opinions than other people and I need to be open-minded commercially for that. Uh, like mm -hmm. if you look at our Matador, our Matador has much more rigid handles, stiffer handles than the Wing Surfer S26. Mm -hmm. um, some people love them. You know, it does give you a much more direct connection. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't like them because your hands get tired. And it's kind of the same with a boom. It depends where you want to go. Um, but it is what it is. Choice is good, you know, and there's, there's people that swear by the boom. They really want a boom. And there's people that don't want to have anything to do with a boom because they love just that light, you know, nothing to hit yourself on structure. So mm -hmm. it's all good. There's a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am... Um... I don't have a transition for that one, <laughs> but I would like to talk about your movie, the documentary, The Longest Wave that came out. Um, and uh, yeah, if someone hasn't watched it, it's on redbull.com. Um, and it's also on, in Germany, it's on the ZDF uh, Mediathek in German. So that's also pretty nice. Um, and uh Yeah, maybe first and foremost, how do you feel about the movie? Do you like it yourself or did you, because you didn't know the, the actual outcome, right? Well, I mean, it's, for me, it's been around for a while already. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's been a, a digesting pro process getting to, to this stage. You know, it, it took a long time to finish the film because of everything that was going on during the the time, you know, with injury and uh, personal issues and whatnot. And when we finally got the film finished and it was slated for theatrical release, you know, Joe Berlinger mm -hmm. is a, a documentary filmmaker, not a, not a surf video guy. So it, it had a trajectory to go in global, you know, theater release and through the film festivals, et cetera. And again, this is Joe Berlinger's movie. It's not my movie. I was the protagonist in it, but it was his mm -hmm. film. You know, he had 100% creative control on where it went, which was, you know, interesting. And I kind of put the keys in his hands and waited to see what happened. Mm -hmm. um, given what he had to work with, I think he did an amazing job weaving a pretty cool story based on where I was at in my life during this time. And you know, putting in the history of, of who I am and how I got here uh, in a, a compelling way. You know, it's not just an action film, which is good. I didn't want just action, action, action. Look at me. Aren't I great? Um, there's action in it. I probably would have liked to have seen more action in it, um, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. It's uh, Uh, and people seem to be liking it. I'm getting, you know, really positive feedback. A lot of people that have some really heartwarming messages uh, about, you know, things that they've learned from the film or it touched them in one way or another, uh, which is great. Um, I'm mm -hmm. stoked that it's not just, oh, it was it was a good 20 minutes of watching people in the wind and waves and I, I moved on to something else. Um, mm -hmm. But it was kind of tough launching it right at the beginning of COVID. We did a couple of film festivals, one in New York, one in uh, Estonia, mm -hmm. and the Tallinn Film Festival, and then boom, the world locked up. And then it was mm -hmm. on hold 
okay, how long is COVID going to last? Is it three months? Is it six months? Wait for theaters, see what happens. Wait, wait for theaters to reopen. Wait for countries to reopen. And I was getting really impatient. You know, after a year or so, I was like, God, can't we sell this thing to Netflix or something so people can see it? People ask, keep asking me, you know, when can they see it? My daughter in the film is this little girl, and my daughter is now taller than me. <laughs> That's how much time seemed to pass uh, uh -huh. waiting to get the film so people could see it. Um, so that was a little, a little tough. It was like, come on, let's go. Um, yeah. The end result now, you know, we did that a little bit of film release in the summer where I went to Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and went to a few theaters and got to meet some people face to face, which was cool, you know, connect with, with some of the audience. Um, but now that it's available for free, that's, the best ever. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that anybody can see it through Rebel TV or through ZF, through Servos TV, just different options. That's the best thing. You know, the more more eyes it gets to, uh, the better, because they put a lot of energy into it. You know, Red Bull put a lot of money into making that thing. Um, Joe Berlinger uh, is a really talented director. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really cool to work with a crew like that. And it was difficult to see it going nowhere and knowing mm -hmm. that all these really talented people put all this energy into it. And then it was like stuck. And I was like, mm -hmm. shit, you know, really? We went through all of that and it's not even going to get out. Nobody's going to see it. Um, so I'm feeling better about it now that people can actually see it. And there's some, yeah, some reward or, or uh, at least, something to be shown for all of the work that so many people put into the, the mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. I, I remember a statement of yours saying that if, if I wouldn't be doing this in brackets, being a professional waterman is probably what you can identify with. Um, I would probably just sell burgers or something like that. I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that statement? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have uh, an idea what I'd be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was thinking to myself, I kind of get what you want to say with that because you're you are water sports. So uh, just to gi to give people some perspective, like in Germany, we we call windsurfing surfing, and this is because of Robin Nash. So. If I going to tell someone that I actually want to go surfing in my holiday, I have to explain, uh, ah, you mean this pro and pedal surfing? Yes, not windsurfing. Right. <laughs> Because <laughs> here it's like Robin Nash and surfing. It's like the saying still. So, um, but the, the whole point of my story is like, I, I get what you're saying, but I feel like you have this mindset and that's also in the movie that, that hunger and that, that thrive And I feel like if you would have your mindset put on something else, you would probably also be very successful in it. And I, I was thinking, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not like stuck in a rut. I don't mean it in a way that, yeah, if, if I didn't have surfing, I'd be uh, like sitting in the corner, uh, you know, doing something worthless. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I work really hard at whatever I'm doing. If I was making burgers, I'd be making really, really good burgers. Like I would work hard to have the best fucking burgers in town. Uh, my McDonald's would be super popular because whatever it is, you know, I, um, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to do things well. So no matter what it is, like if I was work, if I was a landscaper working in the garden, I would get really into it. You know, I try to be the best gardener that I could for, for what I'm working with, not because I want other people to, you know, admire my work, but more just because I, I want to put that kind of energy into what I do, whatever it is. I'm just lucky that I, I do what I do because I'm at least pretty good at this. So it came naturally. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky in, the, in that respect. And, And so my question basically is like, and you already part of answered it, like what do you think are the ingredients of your mindset that made you successful, that made you a world champion and an icon? Um, 
a lot of luck, a lot of being in the right place at the right time, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Being uh, initially a, a bit shy, a little bit self-centered, you know, a little bit... Uh, I guess selfish to a certain degree, uh, a little bit antisocial, which mm -hmm. helped this path as well. I didn't like team sports. I didn't really like doing things with other people. Uh, I love the fact that in the things that I enjoyed doing, which were skateboarding, skimboarding, surfing, then windsurfing, etc. I didn't need anybody else, right? You weren't relying on somebody else to help you to, to, to do it. Um, so being, being self-driven, you know, some people need motivation. Some people mm -hmm. need social stimulus, you know? Uh, they're not gonna have fun going out into the middle of Kailua Bay all by themselves and sailing away from the other people to go to, to go train. They want to be around other people. They need that contact. And that's fine. Everybody's different. But for me, it was kind of the opposite. I really enjoy doing things on my own and um, always have. And I think that helped to excel in these individual sports, which required a lot of self-motivation. And, uh, and then I think what helped a lot was recognizing – um, early on that distractions were a bad thing, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. focus was pretty important if you wanted to keep the ball rolling. And I've always had, <clears throat> had that to a certain degree. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of guys, they have a bit of success. They let it go to their head. They lose focus, they start doing other things, and it slips away. And it was a year or two, and they had a good mm -hmm. time, but now they're doing something else. They moved on uh, mm -hmm. because they didn't realize, or maybe they just didn't care, and they never wanted to, they never liked it that much. Or uh, I think in a lot of cases, they're just too easily distracted. They get distracted by the money, they get distracted by the fame, they get distracted by other opportunities. And, um, and sport becomes less important to them. Mm -hmm. Or, I don't know, I've never been in anybody else's head. It, it's hard to say why, you know, they come and then they, they fade off to something else. I never mm -hmm. wanted to do anything else. And so I worked really hard to try and keep it going. Um, but again, a big part of being able to keep it going has been luck, has been being in the right place at the right time. and. Uh, but I've worked really hard to try and set myself up for that luck. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I could have moved to the gorge. I could have, I don't know, I could have stayed on Oahu and not come to Maui and, and followed, you know, the stronger wind. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that could have been a little bit different where my trajectory would have put me to a different place. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, hard to say. I, I think, being self-driven and self-motivated and a bit selfish is definitely a big part of it for me, at least. Mm -hmm. Not in a bad way, but mm -hmm. in a way that it allowed me to, to, to keep going down this path. Yeah. yeah but that is something that, um, that you hear a lot from very, very successful athletes that they say there is some kind of self-centered notion going on because otherwise you can't take the time to train and go to competitions all the time and and focus on it so yeah i think that's totally legit um what what makes you so special in my um in in, in my point of view is that you didn't have this path you had to pave a path there was no professional windsurfer career uh, inside so your whole life is basically let's say aligned to the to the great decade of windsurfing and then everything kind of worked out and so you had to create your own path and the second thing is you were already super successful as a little kid 
Um, and I was wondering, like, when you won that first world championship, like, how did you understand yourself after that? Did did you did what did you think? What did you believe? What were your? Can you remember that? Um, well, I just had to get back and and focus on school again. Um, but I think part of the benefit for me was that windsurfing was really small here uh, mm -hmm. in Hawaii and in America in general. So it felt like a big deal to me coming back from the Bahamas, but nobody else even knew that I did it basically. You know, there weren't many windsurfers here. No other kids windsurfed. No one in my school windsurfed. No one in my school. I was that weird blonde kid that he does that windsurfing thing. Um, so it kind of put me in a position where I think a lot of other athletes have more pressure. You know, because for the, for the first many, many, many years of my career, I was nobody at home. It didn't. I was not on their radar, you know, so it was a lot easier to, to keep humble, to keep, you know, focused, to not get a big head, which I think is important for an athlete not to get a big head um, mm -hmm. because nobody gave a shit. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody knew what I was doing. You know, windsurfing was big on the other side of the world and unless you somehow got a windsurfing magazine, you didn't know that I went to the Bahamas or Sardinia or Cancun <laughs> or it wasn't in the news. There was not enough windsurfers in the community that the word got out. Uh, it was interesting and it was, I think it was good for me because I could get, you know, my sponsors and, you know, my money and everything from a world that was a bit disconnected from the reality of, of everyday life here. Mm -hmm. And I think humility is important. And that, that kind of helped me to stay um, humble and, and under the radar mm -hmm. where other athletes, where, you know, everybody knows who you are and your face is everywhere and you go to the grocery store and everyone's like, Hey, well, there he is. I think that might be harder. Um, mm -hmm. and I was in sports that were really not established sports. So I think that also helped, you know, we were, mm -hmm. we were cool and different. Nobody gave a shit about windsurfing or even kiting in the beginning. And it's, it's funny. It, it wasn't here until, uh, Hawaii extreme sports, an ocean paddler TV. A friend of mine has a, a production company, Alex Reinprecht here in Hawaii. And he does a series of programs. He's been doing it now for maybe 2008, 18, maybe, maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it's local programming. It, it goes around the world, but it's local programming that gets out on the normal TV here. So if you don't have cable, if you just have normal TV service, this is a local sports show that's on TV all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we had, you know, a lot of stand up paddle episodes. We had some kite surfing episodes. We've had wing foiling episodes. And so for all these years of being a professional athlete and, you know, making millions of dollars around the world and being super famous in Europe and in Hawaii, nobody knew who I was. And now over the last like 10, 12 years, Now everybody here knows who I am because I'm on this local TV sports show a lot <laughs> with these great programs. So it's, it's funny. Um, so, so now in, here all the locals know who I am because they see me on, on local television doing winging in Kailua or, uh, you know, a, a kiting episode uh, from the North Shore or, or whatever. It's the dynamic changes as technologies evolve and, and change. But I think I was very fortunate to be involved with the sports I was involved with in the time that I was involved and didn't have the pressure 
of social media. And I mean, a lot of people will say it's not pressure, it's opportunity. Yeah, I, it's opportunity, but I, I liked it better <laughs> before social media. I, mm-hmm. It was different. Life was simpler. Uh, before you had to be a self promoter as well. Like I just read an interview with Kai Lenny and it's, it's exactly what I was saying uh, to myself and to to other people that to be an athlete. Now you don't just have to be an athlete. You have to be an athlete and you need to be a self promoter and you need to be your own little production company. And you need to, Mm -hmm. um, that is not fun to me. Some people thrive on, you know, look at me. Mm. Uh, fuck, mm. I hate it. And so it's, it's really different. It puts a different a different parameter of pressure on an athlete to not just focus on training and being good, but also content, making sure you're, mm. you know, doing your Instagram posts every day. What's your next project? Keeping everybody in the loop of what you're up to. It's really different. So I, I have a lot of respect for, for guys like Kai that are doing a good job in that and juggling all the balls and, and thriving in it because um, I wouldn't do as well in that environment if I were a young athlete today because, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, I'm just – I'm not built that way. I'm not that in love with myself that I can go, you know, <laughs> talk to people every day. It's just – it's different. Mm-hmm. You you just mentioned Kai Lenny and and I think he's he's a great storyteller. Um, that that's super interesting about him. But every time I see him kite surfing, uh, you rarely see him kite surfing these days. He looks exactly like you when you're kiting. It's like I see Kai Lenny and say, "This is Robbie Nash doing his thing," you know, like in the early days of kiting. So that's super cool that that he, yeah. The, he is mentored by you, right? And then you kind of took him under under your wing. And and I was wondering how how did it how did it get started? Like where did you meet? Well, I I knew his parents uh, even mm-hmm. before he was born because his mom and dad were already living here uh, on the North Shore. Uh, Martin Lenny Kai's dad was a friend of Don Montague. Don Montague was my kite designer. Uh, sail designer in the early days of Nash. Um, you know, he, he eventually went off to work for Google, but uh, for years he was, you know, my really good friend and designer and Martin was a friend of his. So I knew him in the early days of windsurfing here. He moved to Maui to be a, mm-hmm. you know, recreational windsurfer as a lot of people have over the years. And so I knew Kai from the time he was a little kid and um, mm-hmm. yeah just kind of grew up. He started doing the sports. We started giving him equipment and it, it grew from there into the, uh, into the phenomenon that it is today. You know, he's really, Mm -hmm. he's really taken of all the guys that have had all this opportunity because there's a lot of kids on the North shore of Maui that have had a lot of opportunity. There's a Mm -hmm. lot of parents that moved here for windsurfing and kiting and raised their kids on the North shore of Maui. Uh, and, And Kai is definitely one that took, the guidance from all of us and Mm -hmm. uh, looked at the opportunities and digested them very, very well. You know, Mm -hmm. he's, he's a good athlete. He wasn't great when he was a kid, but he's turned himself through hard work, dedication, focus. He's turned himself into one of the best athletes in the world and not just as an athlete, but as, what an athlete needs to be he's he's eloquent he's a great self-promoter he's you know he's into the the non-sportsman side of being an athlete which is equally important these days there's a lot of guys that are really good surfers or wind surfers or kiters but they lack the skill set to get out there right to to promote themselves to be focused to make it you know into something Uh Um, but Kai's been been able to put that all together very, very well, which is mm-hmm. super cool. Yeah, and he is kind of the uh, a phenomena also in in social media because if if something happens in the world of big wave surfing or and you see it on on Kai Lenny's uh, profile, it's like it's out there. Everybody knows about it. Uh, he's kind of connecting also the the people from different disciplines because. 
if you're into big wave surfing, you're gonna have him on your on your list. If you are into windsurfing, you're gonna have him on your list. So, and this is an aspect that I really like because I'm an amateur by heart, but I just love to do different things. And it's so cool that that we are not in this in this fight anymore. You know, like yeah. windsurfers it, against kite surfers. And yeah, it's it's nice that there's some cross pollination now. That it's it's accepted that yeah, I mean. we're lucky because we have all this gear and we live in Maui and we're sponsored and we fuck, we can do five sports. Most people don't have the time or the money to do five sports. So I, I'm hesitant when I start to tell people, Oh, you should embrace everything. It's all good. It's like, you know, I, I understand most people don't have the time or the money mm -hmm. to fucking do all this stuff. Um, And if all you do is boogie board or all you do is short board or all you do is kite, that is totally okay too. Uh, there was mm -hmm. nothing wrong with being a hundred percent focused on one thing. It's a bummer if you hate everything else because you only do that one thing. But I understand that too. Like the whole thing with surfers versus wind servers versus kiting. I get it. It's, you know, I, I can understand looking at those guys and going, fuck, you know, like, yeah, I wish I had free time all day and sponsors paying me money and guys giving me free equipment from every frigging sport in the world. And I don't have that. I have mm -hmm. one day a week, if I'm lucky, where I can go surfing. I have enough money for two surfboards and I surf. And, and I can even see some resentment, you know, when you see right. us, you know, Kai, whoever standing there going, oh, everything's so great. Da, da, da. It's like, we have to remember how lucky we are to do what we do and be careful mm -hmm. not to rub it in people's faces too much. Um, mm -hmm. Because I can see resentment there, you know, it's, you can have too much of a good thing if, if mm -hmm. you're not careful. So I think, Again, maintaining some humility is important and understanding how most people's lives are is important. Um, but again, like you said, I think it's cool that it's not completely frowned upon to do more than mm -hmm. one sport. You know, you're not a kook. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the old days, oh, you're a kook if you do those other sports because you're just not good at anything. It's like, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, well, not really because we're pretty good at all of those sports. But, um <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand the argument because everybody comes from a different background and a different different set of opportunities, so to speak, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Robbie, let's let's switch gears and um let's have a couple of questions to wrap this podcast up. And if you want, you can answer them probably pretty pretty short and quick. Um, so a question that everybody loves me to, to, um, ask is what's your leash setup? Because leash is the most annoying thing in winning. So you know, what's your solution to it? I am total freaking old school. Like, you know, our new wings, they have a coil leash for the wrist to the wing. Uh, I still like my old straight. you know, surfboard leash to the wrist, to the mm -hmm. wing, and a standard surfboard leash to my ankle. Um, Solid. I don't love the coil leash. I don't like the waist leash. Uh, you know, we're, we have them all available at this point. We're doing all these different things because I know different people like different things. Some of my guys like different things for different reasons. And that's, that's why it's good, too, to have, you know, engineers and guys on the team that all come from different backgrounds because they mm -hmm. swear by a certain style of thing. And I just go, oh, my God, <laughs> can you write to that? Um, but I'm, I'm still a firm believer, believer in both leashes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's important to promote that. So I still use a wrist leash. I still use a foot leash. I don't put the two together. Uh, mm -hmm. for good reason. Like it's windy here. If, if you're out on a lake and it's 10 knots, you probably don't need 
any leash. Like if you can swim, you're going to catch your stuff if you fall down in 10 knots. But if it's mm -hmm. 20 or 30 knots, I'm a good swimmer. And if I lose my stuff, if I'm lucky, I can catch it. You know, I made that mistake mm -hmm. early on. And mm -hmm. I swim really fast. I don't dog paddle. I swim. <laughs> and um, your wing goes and your board goes. The, the board starts heading downwind and it starts doing this and it gets up on the foil and you will lose your board in not very strong wind. That thing will take off if it goes the wrong way. So I still tell people, well, I, I recommend you use a leash. And I still recommend that you don't go further from shore then you're comfortable swimming either. Yeah. You know, people forget that, you know, this is still, I mean, you're on an inflated wing. That thing could mm -hmm. pop for sure. Yeah. A, a million different ways. So you might have to swim or paddle in. You could still lose your board. Your leash could break. Your foil could snap off. There's just make sure that if, if you don't swim very well, you should think twice before you go five kilometers out to sea, just assuming that everything's going to stay intact and, and perfect. So, yeah, yeah. Be, be careful. Even if it seems easy and secure, you should still you know, pay attention to your, yeah. your stuff. Yeah, that's great advice, especially for, for people who are already okayish in water sports for two or three years, but we have already lost, lost a couple of guys because of broken power joint. Or a broken boom. I mean, it can be super dangerous if you're two kilometers out and the sun is setting and, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're, I mean, you're gone. And a lot of people can't swim very well. I mean, there's, yeah. there's really good surfers and you see them break their leash and they can't swim. Like they can't mm -hmm. swim. They like dog mm -hmm. paddling the channel stuck in the rip and you go, oh my God, how... How could you get that good at surfing and never really learn to swim, swim? Like if your life mm -hmm. depended on it, swim. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just l learn the basics as well. As you get better in the sport, every once in a while, jump off your shit and go do a couple laps by the beach swimming so you still remember how to swim. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Um, you already mentioned that that regular guy doesn't have the money and the time to do all the stuff. So let's, let's imagine you would be a regular guy. I, um, you get a ticket you don't know where, it, where the ticket is going. So you have to go to the airport and you can take one quiver, like a regular quiver, you know, like when I check in my gear, I have one quiver, it's maybe 25, 30 K, not more uh, kilograms. Sorry. So what yeah. would you take on a surf trip? where you don't know what conditions to expect, but you want to make the most out of wherever you end up. What's so in that taking, quiver? Taking wing foiling gear or? You can, you can take whatever you want. Well, it depends where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so you go, let's say you go to the, to the sea, but you know, it's, it's kind of unpredictable. Do you have light winds, strong winds, small waves, medium waves? You just know, hey, let's have, let's have two hour, two weeks and Let's make the most out of it. Uh, I really, it really depends where I'm going and, and what the <laughs> anticipated conditions are. I still think if I knew there was going to be some surf, some wind, but wasn't sure how much, etc., uh, at my level, I'd probably still take kite gear mm -hmm. because i mean unless there was a chance there was going to be no wind at all also then i would bring probably a stand-up paddleboard with me as well mm -hmm. uh, like i would do a surf trip to mexico every year with jerry lopez and some other friends we went to a place called cardone surf camp in mexico mm -hmm. and it was a little private left-hander Mm -hmm. Really fun wave, not a real wave of consequence, but just a really fun wave to go spend uh, time with friends. And every afternoon there would be a thermal, mm -hmm. some wind, never very strong, but strong enough to make the surf shitty. So on that trip, I would always bring a, a regular surfboard, like a 510. Mm -hmm. I'd bring one stand-up board, 8.3, all around. 
and I would bring one kite board and a 10 meter, back then I was bringing a 10 meter trip, 10 meter pivot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with that, when the wind got blown out, I could usually still get out and enjoy the surf. I would say mm -hmm. wing foiling gear, but there's times that a foil is not the best tool in the waves, right? In mm -hmm. real waves, a foil is kind of your enemy. You can do it, mm -hmm. but it's more a novelty, right? There's a, there's better waves ways to ride waves than on a foil. Um, if I knew mm -hmm. there was no waves and it was just flat water, mm -hmm. I would bring my wing stuff for sure. If I knew what kind of waves and what the bottom was like and the wind direction, you know, I might bring my wing stuff as well to a surf spot. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, I've got too many choices, right? So I've, <laughs> <laughs> in certain places, I'm going to bring my windsurfing stuff and nothing else because I know if I get there and I don't have windsurfing stuff, I'm going to be really pissed. So, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a tough Probably. question to ask someone that has. Yeah. yeah. Too much shit. <laughs> I just realized that, <laughs> but thanks for explaining it. And yeah, a very last question. Um, in all these years that you spent in the ocean, what did you, what was your main lesson that you learned? If there is any, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I could come up with a hundred different answers. So probably not fair to the other 99 answers to just answer <laughs> one, you know? Um, yeah, I, I can't break it down to one lesson. I'm still learning every day. So, and it's, it's funny because the older I get, the more I think I'm learning, right? Because you, mm -hmm. you start to digest experiences. You start to digest things that you did before you start to look at things moving forward differently. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still learning. Fortunately, still mm -hmm. having fun learning, you know, I haven't got to the point where I'm reflecting negatively as some old people do. Ah, the old days were so much better. I, I still love right now. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that would be my lesson. No matter what's going on, make every day the best you can be. Life's what you make it. Um, so yeah, make, make every day the best it can be and live well today to set yourself up for tomorrow. Hopefully, you know, well said, thank you very much for being in the podcast and taking the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. My, my pleasure. And then, I, yeah, uh, this is the only other thing I'd have to say when, when we talk about like all the gear I have, yeah, some people some people have almost no gear and they still don't take care of it. Like I get free <laughs> gear, obviously, but it's not free. I actually pay for it. My guys get free gear, but somehow I pay for everything, <laughs> but I take <laughs> such good care of my equipment. Like my wings are clean. They're perfectly rolled. My boards are in order. My stuff is in order. I see other guys, like some of my team riders, everything is just thrown into the back of the truck. And it's like, Oh my God. So yeah, I, I do have a lot of equipment, but I take really good care of my equipment. I, yeah, I cherish it. I have boards that are 30 years old that look brand new. So um, yeah, I don't take it for granted. You know, it's not like I have this mm -hmm. shit everywhere and I grab another one and oh, I can get three boards, I'll throw it up. Like I will use one board until it's dead and then I'll fix it. So. Mm -hmm. My equipment is, is, uh, sacred, you know, it's, it's, it's valuable stuff. I, I never mm -hmm. take it for granted. It's not just thrown around in the back of my truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great thing to, if you can still be grateful for all the gear and the opportunity and the, the sessions that you have on the water, yeah. even in your position. I mean, the, that's awesome. Yeah. Great. Grateful every single day. Awesome. 
Thank you very much, Borby. I hope to make it to Hawaii sometime and someday, <laughs> like everybody. <laughs> you should. It's still worth coming. It's a good place. So for sure, it's a it's a childhood dream. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. Well, hopefully sure. we will see you here. And until then, maybe I'll see you in Germany. Yeah, I need um, I need to go you, for a wing. I need to go for a wing session over there. Go cruise around and yeah, do some winging on lakes that I've never been to. Be my guest. We we also wing a lot on some river spots. We will be happy to have you. Thanks. Sounds good. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Sounds right. Aloha. Have a good night. Guys, if you've been sticking around to the end of this episode, that means you are a true member of the wing foil experience community that also means you're super stoked about wing foiling and it also means you like listening to these cool interviews you can contribute to these interviews if you want to you just dm me on instagram who you'd like in the show which questions i should cover more maybe also which topics maybe there's some wing foil related topics maybe wing foil related questions but it could also be um just uh, uh water sports related stuff whatever you feel like is appropriate to this podcast let me know about it because um, some of you already do and i'm really following up on each and every one and seeing what we can do about it and seeing how we can get your ideas into this podcast so let me know about it dm me on instagram at dgraffe i put it in the show note as always Tell your friends about this podcast if you like it. And as always, look at your forecast. And if you see some wind, go wing it. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down.